So it happened that the ancient Greek goddess Tethys married her brother Oceanus. Oceanus and Tethys gave birth to 3,000 sons, river streams, and 3,000 daughters, the Oceanids. The parents instructed the Oceanids to look after their wayward brothers, to ensure that the rivers behave decently, don't go out of their banks, don't destroy settlements, provide enough irrigation water for crops, and generously share their moisture with people and animals. The name of one of Tethys's daughters was Asia, or Asia as we would pronounce today. She was responsible for the great rivers in the mysterious land of the Scythians. This title firmly entered the geographical science already during the time of Herodotus. The father of geography claimed that the border of Europe and Asia ran along one of the rivers in the foggy expanses where griffins guard the gold of the Scythians. Over the past centuries, geographers have figured out the borders of Asia, yet the question of where its geographical center is located still causes heated debate. In the capital of the Republic of Tuva, the city of Kazil, there stands the center of Asia obelisk. An equally impressive stele was erected in China in the city of Yongfen, near the administrative center of Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, the city of Urumqi. If you draw a direct line from Urumqi to Kazil on the map, then about in the middle we will see the Altai Mountains. Since we live in the age of multivectinous, we will respect both points of view and will take the arithmetic mean. In this case, the hypothetical center of Asia is located in our ends, somewhere in the Altai. So we also have the right to build a corresponding monument to attract tourists. Many peoples called the Altai the navel of the earth. The myth about Asia, the daughter of Tethys, perfectly echoes the fact that a significant part of Asia has indeed risen from the bottom of primary ocean, Tethys. The Altai Mountains do give birth to great Asian rivers, whose violent waters the mighty Oceanid was to control. The times of myths and legends have long passed, and now people themselves, without the help of the Oceanids, have learned to manage rivers. The Altai is sacral for all Turkic peoples. 200 million Turks from different countries of the world consider this place their ancestral homeland. For environmentalists, Altai is a treasury of biodiversity. Over 100 mammal and 350 avian species live here in addition to more than 2,000 species of higher vascular plants. Every tourist and photographer in the world dreams of coming here. Just go on the internet and you will see thousands of beautiful images taken in the Altai by travelers from various countries. My name is Freya. I am from New York in the USA. And I am having an excellent time here in Kazakhstan. It's my first time here. This country is beautiful. To ensure proper development of ecotourism, it is extremely important that tourists have the opportunity to observe and take pictures of wild animals. My dad saw a bear and a cub on the trip. I have seen a lot of really cool birds that we don't get at home. For hydrologists, Altai is the catchment watershed of multiple large rivers without which we would simply not exist. For local residents, Altai is their home, providing them with shelter and food. For governments, it is the land of abundant mineral reserves and hydrological resources. Altai landscape and biological diversity are the most valuable resource which we must preserve by all means. The World Wildlife Fund has been preserving the Altai Sayan ecoregion for almost 25 years, since 1998. It is a transboundary zone shared by Russia, Kazakhstan and Mongolia. It is one of the 200 global ecoregions on the planet, holding 97% of the entire planet's biodiversity. Planet. 
In the early 20th century, academician Vladimir Vernatsky proposed the theory of the biosphere working as a single system in which all living organisms are interconnected among themselves and the landscapes around by billions of invisible links. Animals, plants and the protozoa are continuously changing and thus alter the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere, soil and water. For 4 billion years, the biosphere has evolved without our participation. Comparing the whole natural history with days, the humans have appeared only a couple of seconds before midnight, yet have already done quite a lot in the course of these seconds. The problem is that we are changing the appearance of our planet millions of times faster than it happened before us. In 2014, the Canton Karagai National Park was awarded the status of a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, and in 2020 the same status was given to the Western Altai Reserve. The status is assigned to specially protected areas in order to promote research, including with the participation of international specialists. It is one of the highest statuses for SBAs. The more such specially protected areas a country has, the higher the status of the country itself. Vernatsky called the reason-based, self-regulating biosphere the noosphere. So far, we don't know much about the secret threads linking the various elements of our world into a single organism called the biosphere, but we are learning quite quickly indeed. According to Vernatsky's theory, the main threat to our civilization lies in the ability of our mind to change the world too quickly. Yet, this is also our main hope. We remain hopeful that the minds of our children and grandchildren will allow them, overcoming all the current challenges and live in harmony with nature. Tens of thousands of scientists and practitioners around the world are searching for an answer to the most burning question which the modern world is facing – how to reconcile the conservation of biological resources with their sustainable use. When UNESCO approves a territory as a biosphere reserve, the specially protected area includes not only the actual reserve itself, for example the Western Altai Reserve, but also the adjacent territories. This is the so-called core area, where economical activities are generally prohibited. Even these supporting animals. Buffer and cooperation zones are where local residents continue conducting their economic activities, but with certain restrictions. Altai is located at the junction of the Great Steppe, Siberian Taiga and semi-deserts of Mongolia and China. As you know, at the junction of landscape zones, biological diversity looms especially large, and at the junction of different civilizations, a new socio-cultural code emerges, absorbing the best of different traditions. In the 5th, 6th centuries AD, the clan of Prince Ashina mixed with the local Altai tribes and on the slopes of the Altai mountains founded the state called the Eternal El of the Turkic people. Apparently, the dialect of this ruling clan formed the basis of the single ancient Turkic language. Quite quickly, this language spread from southern Siberia to Jetesu and the agricultural regions of Sogdiana. In the 7th century, the Turkic Khaganate achieved its greatest power and controlled the vast areas from Manjuria to the North Caucasus. Both in ancient times and now, the strength and power of states largely depend on natural resources, foremost on what resources? Well moistened pastures, lush with grass and engrossed herds of livestock provided nomadic civilizations with resources for development and expansion. On the contrary, drought and steppe murians often led to political crises. Blighted by natural cataclysms, peoples became easy victims of aggressive neighbors. The 
Kazakhstan, part of the Altai mountain system can be conditionally divided into southern, Kalbin and western Altai. The western Altai includes the mountain ranges between the Ulba and Buktama rivers. In the east, it borders on the Gorni Altai Republic and in the west on the Yetis River. Despite the fact that the ridge begins near the regional center, it is one of the most inaccessible and poorly populated regions of Kazakhstan. The severe taiga climate with heavy snowfalls, early winter and late spring, with stormy spring floods and protracted summer rains, does not contribute to agricultural development. In the foothills of the western Altai, mining is well developed, hence its second name, Rudni or Or Altai in English. In accessible areas, they harvest timber. In the lower mountain zones, there are apiaries and farms, and in the upper reaches, local residents collect pine nuts, berries, as well as provide services to tourists and engage in hunting. The rivers of the western Altai are famous for fishing. In the upper reaches, there's plenty of grayling. In the lower reaches, there's pike, perch, eyed, burbot and other fish species. By law, fishermen can catch up to 5 kilograms of fish per day. There is also taimen or salmon trout, but it is included in the red list and fishing for it is prohibited. At first glance, mountain and taiga sections of the western Altai appear totally excluded from economic activity. There is an opinion that they do not bring any economic profit. In fact, it's totally not so. There is a concept of ecosystem services, so this territory firstly accumulates snow in winter. This is the catchment area of the Yetis River, which provides water to all these living and working along its course. This is also a resting place for animals. Exactly thanks to this place, it is possible to preserve nature around. The mountains here are steep, the forests are full of deadfall, there are dozens of stormy rivers, swamps and lakes. In winter, two to three meters of snow falls. In summer, the Arctic cyclones sweep over the West Siberia lowland and stumbling upon the wall of the Altai Mountains shed lengthy rains. Spring floods erode roads and demolish bridges, which creates additional difficulties for the economic development of taiga areas. Yet the harsh landscapes provide natural protection for many species of animals and plants. During the spring flood period, no vehicles can pass in the mountain taiga zone except for caterpillar tractors. If the water level is not very high, it is possible to cross the rivers on a large truck. But even the heavy-duty Ural truck cannot get everywhere. Experienced taiga dwellers cross the rivers by boat, but this requires considerable skill. To do so, they choose calm river sections without rapids. You can also build a suspension crossing. By the end of summer, the moisture that had accumulated in the mountain leaves and the river water level drops sharply. It is hard to guess the violent spring flow in this tiny stream. The animal world of the Western Altai has become a kind of symbol of wealth and diversity. The brown bear is called the Taiga Master. It is commonly known that around the world, first of all, large predators suffer from this civilization pressure. Yet it looks like nothing is threatening bears in the Black Taiga. Bear is a special animal and to a degree is very similar to humans. It is omnivorous, inhabits all types of landscapes from the jungle to polar rise, is quite able to defend itself and is far from stupid. Bears adapt quickly to a changing environment. Where food resources are limited, they vigilantly protect their individual feeding plots from relatives, but if it becomes possible to catch a fish or get some nuts or berries, they do not hesitate to abandon their plots and migrate en masse to more favorable areas. 
In winter, wild ungulates, mooses, morals and roe deer escape deep snow on the southern slopes of the ridges in the mountain Altai. But as soon as the passes open in spring, their large-scale spring migration to Kazakhstan begins. The mighty mooses are the first ones to make the path in the dense snow, then follow the morals and roe deer, and then come the predators – bears, wolverines and wolves. Roe deer travel alone and in small groups. After the transition, roe deer evenly distribute throughout all suitable habitats. Roe deer youngsters appear at the end of May, and over the summer they grow up so much that it is already difficult to distinguish them from adults. The mating season among roe deer begins in August and among morales in early September, with the first called the ungulates again gathering groups and prepare for the return transition. We have examined the valley of the Black Yates and its tributaries flowing from the Altai, including the Buktarma, Kolzhir and Kurshim, as well as some small rivers flowing down from the Saur and Tarbagatai. Next, we want to go to the Western Altai. To the Rida area? Exactly. It turns out it's impossible to go there straight from here. We will need to go back to Oskemen and only then drive to Rida. Afterwards, we will need a special vehicle because, except for a caterpillar all terrain vehicle, or a helicopter, there is no other way of getting around the area. We cannot afford a helicopter, so we will have to rent a good Land Rover from the locals. Firstly, because the rivers there are now full of water. What about horses? Not this year. This year, about 90% of the total precipitation fell at the end of winter. Starting late February up to the end of April. The mean annual volume. Yes, as I mentioned before, the precipitation period shifted two months, even two and a half months into the spring. It led to the following situation. The land without the usual snow cover froze in the first half of winter. And then a lot of snow fell. After it got warm, the snow started quickly melting, causing floods that swept over the frozen soil across the area, including settlements. The water level in the rivers rose, also destroying bridges. With gradual precipitation, the soil slowly absorbs the water and it flows down the mountains via dozens of streams and rivers. In the fall, the river water level falls and it's possible to cross them on foot. This year, there's still too much water. I even doubt a rough terrain vehicle will get us somewhere. Poppy and tulips bloom in the valleys. People walk in t-shirts, demoiselle cranes promenade in pairs along the roads. They come to eastern Kazakhstan region in early April and usually nest in open spaces with tall grass. These gorgeous birds are included in the red list of Kazakhstan. Their main threat is the degradation of their traditional habitats due to plowing and overgrazing as well as stray dogs. We are entering the town of Rida. It is located in the upper reaches of the Ulbar River at the foot of the Ivanov Ridge. In 1786, a detachment of geologists led by mining engineer Philip Rida discovered a polymetallic ore deposit in the upper streams of the Ulbar River. Today, they mine zinc, lead and precious metals here. Yevgeny Sidalnikov, director of the Black Uba tourist camp, agreed to give us a lift on his all-terrain truck and show some truly wild and deserted places. The 
central part of the ridge is occupied by the Western Altai Reserve. It is adjacent to the buffer and cooperation zones where scientists, together with local residents, develop nature-friendly types of nature management, primarily tourism of course. Several hunting and tourist farms also operate in the remote corners of the Western Altai. In recent years, fur has fallen in price and the traditional occupation of local residents, commercial hunting, has lost its former economic significance. At present, the former harsh taiga hunters are mastering the difficult trade of tourism managers. Tiger residents are accustomed to harsh conditions, but tourists require a certain level of comfort. Local tour operators need to buy modern camping gear and equipment. Yevgeny and his wife manage a small tourist camp. These who want to relax from the city bustle can simply live in forest silence for a couple of days or order an eco-tour. With some persistence, tourists can even get to see and film wild animals. Prior to coming here, we were at the Black Yates and there was very little water there. Now we came to its catchment zone and there is plenty of water here. We managed to catch the first fauna representative right next to the camp. A lone swan decided to get some rest after a long journey. If you get up before dawn, you can see the grouse courtship. The most decisive male is the first one to descend to the meadow. It fluffs its tail and starts singing and dancing. Its companions and competitors join it very soon. No female grouse can resist such choreography. In fact, this is a real night contest only without blood. The best dancer wins the lady's heart. The spectacle, of course, is extremely beautiful, but it would be even better if another hour dream came true, observing the wood grouse courtship. As it turned out, it's not easy at all. We had to walk for about five kilometers to get from the camp to the courtship glade. Our guide, Uncle Vitya, knows the secret parts as the back of his hand. Along the way, we encountered several hazel grouses. They say that hazel grouses also have a courtship ritual, but we weren't lucky enough to see this performance with our own eyes. As soon as snow begins melting on the southern mountain slopes, the first purple flowers appear. This is Siberian Kandik or Radis fern. Before it was included in the red list, people collected its bulbs for food. It wasn't the best treat in the world, but could help quenching hunger. Now such a dish can cost too much. In accordance with Article 339 of the Criminal Code of the Republic of Kazakhstan, illegal destruction of red-listed plants is a criminal offense, punished with a fine of up to 3,000 minimum wage units or $18,000. have not heard about the red list and are still enjoying the Eddas fun without holding back. They had slept in their dens from late October until early April and are very hungry now. Most of the taiga is still covered with deep snow, so bears gather in the glades with the first green sprouts. Anemones and corydalis grow together with adders fern. These delicate flowers appear only for a few days in early spring to please our eyes and disappear until next year.
Chipmunks also don't mind having an adder's fern lunch. They are lucky that their fur was never of interest to hunters, so they are not afraid of humans. Cowlily is also a spring geophyte. It grows along the banks of streams and swamps. Palace Primrose is also blooming along the first spring forest edges. You can see it in the alpine meadows above the forest zone. Another spring bright yellow flower was named after a shepherd and hunter named Adonis, who was so handsome that the goddess of love Aphrodite herself fell in love with him. When Adonis fell victim to a wild boar, Aphrodite turned drops of his blood into beautiful flowers. This plant is successfully used for treating cardiovascular diseases. Birch, asp and willow riparian woods grow in the valleys along rivers. On the mountain slopes, there's plenty of fir with large and dasp undergrowth. Ascending beyond 1,000 meters above sea level, you will probably see large tall trees with long needles. It's the cedars. Above the forest zone, there begins the alpine tundra, and even higher up, there stand the snow-covered mountain peaks. Here you can see a bird quite exotic for our latitudes, tundra partridge. There are multiple lakes in the tundra zone. In some of them, there's fish, some are empty. Wood grouses begin their mating rituals in the dark. We decided to occupy an observation position in the evening. Fortunately, the weather was dry and there was no rain. Our guide, Uncle Vitya, set up a temporary camp 500 meters down the slope and our cameraman stayed in the sleeping bag under a large fir tree. But something went wrong. Once again, I got convinced that it's much more difficult to be a photo hunter than a conventional one. For two days I've tried to film a courting wood grouse. The first night I was about 70 meters away. It came out from the other side of the hill. I scared it when I started filming and it flew away. The second night I decided to be on the other side of the hill. It flew in at night and sat on the tree right above me. It spent the whole night there and for some reason in the morning it decided to go behind the slope. I tried following it but scared it away again. I got some nice pictures still. Yet the advantage of photo hunters is that there is always a consolation prize for them. Even if it's a regular thrush or a snake. A female black-throated thrush flew in attracted by a male's wobble. It's a little out of the way, but things happen in nature. And then, all of a sudden, a callous squirrel appeared on the nearby branch. An hour later, a curious chipmunk paid a visit. The main thing is to sit quietly and not move. The higher upstream you ascend, the harsher the climate gets. In Taiga, there are no permanent human dwellings, only temporary hunter huts here and there. Winter is long and summer is short here. In late September, already comes the snow which stays on the northern slopes until the end of May. Everyone who has been to the Western Altai of course wants to take a picture of the Taiga master. But encountering a bear at the distance suitable for a good image requires a lot of patience. When you want to take a picture or film an animal, you can sit on the trail for the whole day, or even two, or even three waiting for it. 
but it might not come at all. Bears' vision is not that good, but they do have a magnificent sense of smell and excellent hearing. They can notice a human long before a human will notice them and walk away imperceptibly. Once I wanted to photograph a bear that came to our gorge. There were a lot of tracks, literally everywhere around. I set up a tent and lived there for a few days only to see how the tracks got older and then disappeared altogether. Then I moved to another gorge, and there was also a lot of tracks, but the bear did not come even though I also spent several days there. Finally, we got some luck. It's the first time for me to see such a light brown bear in the Altai. It is still quite young, but already very careful. He walks through the forest without entering the open meadows. We are used to seeing carefree bears in Alaska in the National Geographic movies. There they calmly let the operators come up to them as closely as a couple of meters. But Siberian bears behave differently. See, it almost doesn't cross open spots. It tries to move in the darkness of the forest all the time. Bears have a wide range of color variability, from pale yellow to dark brown. Then there are also almost black ones. The black ones are usually larger than the lighter colored. We came to the Western Altai in summer, in spring, in winter and in the fall. And every time it looked as if we were in a different world. Show the beauty of the landscapes and film as many animals as possible. But it turned out that each season here is unique. In the spring you will not get into the tundra lake zone at all. Once we came here in mid-June for 10 days and had sit in our hut and did not film anything except for wet grass 2 meters high. When we came back at the end of August, everything looked completely different here. Humans have been collecting cedar nuts from time immemorial. In the Soviet times, forestry administrations collected them in commercial volumes and now anyone can do it with a special permission. Yet breaking cedar trees to procure the cones is strictly prohibited and is punished with a huge fine. In city shops, a kilogram of in-shell nuts costs about 6,000 tenge or $14. Well, a whole bucket of cones gave us this small bowl of clean nuts. This is the mechanism used to get the nuts out. Some years are more bearing than others. Collecting nuts is a technically complicated business, so today very few people are doing it. Everyone knows that Altai is famous for its medicinal herbs. In the past, the La Crosse Prom State Corporation used to procure raw materials for the pharmaceutical industry, and today, individual companies and folk killers are doing the same. More than 2,000 herbs grow here, many of which are medicinal. Many are included in the red list, so professionally trained people should be engaged in their collection. Aconite of Foxbane has beautiful flowers but a poisonous root. The deadly effect of this root was first described by Socrates. Most surprisingly, he did it based on his own experience. Noble citizens of the city of Athens sentenced the philosopher to death for disrespect for the gods. After drinking a cup of aconite tincture, Socrates described and dictated the poisoning symptoms to his students until his death that took place an hour and a half later. 
People have long noticed that weak morales greedily eat the morale root or aponticum, hence its popular name morale root. They harvest aponticum roots after the fruit ripen and dry out. In medicine, it is used as an immune enhancing means. Feeding females and males during the mating season especially love the morale root. They eat the leaves and stems as well as dig up the roots using their hooves. Delphinium, or common comfrey, is good for treating lung inflammation, skin diseases, as well as has an antiparasitic effect. Can be poisonous in case of overdose. Hadisarum, or bear root, is used against nervous disorders and male sexual dysfunction. Golden rod inflorescences are good for enhancing renal secretion, balancing salt and water metabolism and acid alkali composition in our body. Rose bay tea allows normalizing sleep, improving mood and increasing overall body performance. It is also recommended against stress and overstraining. Costas, or gentle thistle, grows in the subalpine mountain zone along meadows, rocky slopes and mountain tundra. In medicine, it is used as an anti-parasitic agent. Tansy is capable of accumulating manganese and thus can be used for treating anemia. Careful with dosage as it can get toxic. The ancient Egyptians used tansy for embalming pharaohs. Tree creepers, small animals belonging to their hair order, really like the bitter tansy. They also call tree keepers haymakers because they prepare small haystacks for winter. Sometimes they're actually quite big. They say that earlier, the hunters caught in the mountains by unexpected snowfall used to hide in these tree creeper haystacks. In late summer and autumn, the taiga is especially rich in its natural blessings. You won't die starving for sure. Everyone has probably seen the bracken fern and many have tried it in Japanese, Chinese or Korean restaurants. They salt it, dry and subject to special treatment. As in any other business, professionalism is above all. We once tried putting it in our soup and it turned out completely inedible. Locals brew quite tasty tea from Virginia leaves. In addition, it's good for strengthening blood vessel walls. Anyone can cook blueberry jam or compote. Too lazy to cook? You can safely eat this delicious berry by handfuls. No need to explain how to use strawberries, raspberries or rosehip, right? The only thing to be aware of is that bears also love them and sometimes get so carried away collecting them that they forget about caution. Bumping into a bear in the berry thickets is the last thing that you want to do. In real life, bears are much less benign than in the famous Marsha and Bear cartoon. Mare's tail or horse spine is a powerful anti-inflammatory agent and is used for making multiple legal drugs. Angelica is used not only in medicine to improve heart function but also in cooking as a valuable spice. There are plenty of different mushrooms in the Altai. There are so many of them that it's worth dedicating a whole episode to them. Of course, some of them are poisonous, so prior to embarking on the quiet hunt, we recommend studying this special literature. Everybody knows honey agaric. We cook them in different ways and nobody got sick. In the mountains of the western Altai there are so many untrodden trails, striking landscapes, gorgeous rivers and lakes, different animals and plants that in this episode we managed to show you only a small part of the Altai wealth. 
We'll be back here more than once for sure. Follow us on the Kazakh TV social media accounts. Till next time.